Welcome to our webinar titled Dancing to Improve Mobility and Reduce Falls Risk in Older Adults, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Shamiz Allard, and I am the Knowledge Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, also known as ONF. ONF sponsors the Fall Prevention Communities of Practice, Loop and Loop Jr., along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. So before we begin, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. So during the webinar, if you have questions about the technology, please type them into the webinar chat box. My colleague Margarine and I will be monitoring this. Alternatively, you can also email me at shimiza.olard at onf.org, and I'll include my email in the chat box shortly, and I'll work with you to resolve any technical issues. If you have questions for our presenter about the webinar at any point in time, feel free to submit them through the Q&A box. They will be answered at the end of the webinar. And you'll only be able to view questions you have asked and not questions posed by other participants. Also, the webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants um, in about a week, along with the presentation slides. You can also view previous webinar recordings by simply heading over to the webinar page on Loop and clicking on archived webinars, so right there. So I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Patricia Houston. Dr. Houston is an occupational therapist and postdoctoral fellow at the Jarris Center for Aging Research at McMaster University. Her complete bio of our presenter, please view the Zoom webinar invitation or check out Loop. So now without further ado, please take it away, Patricia. You may now share your screen. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, um, so thank you for the introduction and to everyone for taking their time today to tune in. Uh, today, I hope to share with you my passion about mobility and falls and together how we can help to improve the lives of older adults through innovative falls uh, uh, interventions such as dance. I am honored to receive the postdoctoral funding from Ms. Susan Labarge um, from the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging. And I work as, alongside a fabulous team at the Jarrah Center for Aging Research. Uh, to, to launch this um, webinar, I'd first like to launch a quick poll to see people's experiences uh, with using dance in falls prevention. Uh, so if we can launch that poll, perfect. Um, so we just wanna know what your experience is, if it's clinical, if it's research, if it's both, or it's just an interest that you'd like to explore. So I'll leave this open for a moment. Okay, so uh, we can see the results on the screen here. Uh, so about 27% of people are clinically, uh, it's a clinical interest that they've used it, and 70% it's a new area that they'd like to explore. So this is a great session um, because I'm gonna be providing lots of background information about how to use uh, dance as a falls prevention uh, activity. Okay, so I'm just to, for the bandwidth, I'm gonna turn off my camera here, but uh, you should be able to see the slides. Okay, so for this presentation, I'm going to cover the key concepts of balance, mobility, and falls, and also the evidence-based recommendations for falls prevention. I'm also going to talk about our new program, Jarrah Stance, and how we're using that to prevent falls in older adults. So functional mobility is a concept that we use in occupational therapy to describe mobility during activities. Mobility is foundational to occupational engagement, and balance is the foundation for mobility and underlies our ability to independently engage in daily activities. However, our ability to maintain balance is often overlooked until we experience a problem. Whether that problem is difficulty coming, right, getting out of bed, rising from a chair, or walking on an uneven surface. So in order to understand balance, we first need to understand two key definitions, um, the center of gravity and also the base of support. Um, yep, I can turn on my camera, just one moment, please. There we go. Um, no problem. 
So if in, in photo A here, we can see that the center of gravity lies approximately anterior to the second sacral vertebrae and is located at the base of the back in anatomical position. This line of gravity is important to understand as we visualize a person's ability to successfully maintain balance. And when the line of gravity um, exceeds our base of support, that's when a reaction is needed in order to stay balanced. So when the line of gravity is within that, so that when that blue line is within the base of support, a person is stable. But when the blue line, the center of um, the line of gravity goes outside of the base of support, that's when a person becomes unstable. So when we compare photo A to photo B, we can see that a larger base of support in photo B increases the amount of room where the line of gravity must move. And so there's a longer, um, there's more area and distance where it can fall outside of the base of support. Also in photo B, the center of gravity, a lower center of gravity increases stability. And it's unlikely that it, you'll fall outside of your base of support when it's lower. So there are three main systems that are required for balance. The central nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, and also our sensory systems. So for balance, we have something called postural commands that send predictive feed forward control. So the central nervous system consists of our brain and our spinal cord. And this sends postural commands to our muscles. This generates patterns of muscle activity in order to regulate our center of mass within our base of support. Information about our body position in space is then sent to the somatosensory system. We also receive sensory information from our visual and vestibular systems. All this information, so this uh, the sensory information generates feedback to send to our central nervous system. And this up is called reactive feedback, and it's used to update or correct movements to maintain balance. So to summarize, our central nervous system sends that predictive feed forward control, which is that pre-programmed muscle activation. And our reactive feedback control is from the sensory information to update or correct the movements. The musculoskeletal, um, system helps to activate the muscles and regulate our change in posture and regulate the balance control. The three sensory systems, so the three sensory systems that are important are our somatosensory system, our visual system, and our vestibular system. So when we're in standing balance, we rely 70% on our somatosensory system. We rely 20% on our vestibular system, so the inner ear, and we rely only 10% on our vision. So that's when we're standing. Um, however, these percentages change during dynamic movement. So going back to this diagram here, um, so falls can happen when there's a disruption in any one of these systems. So if there's a disruption in the central nervous system, this disruption can be possibly a reduced reaction time that can affect the speed of the cognitive processing to send those postural commands to in, which may lead to a fall. Within the musculoskeletal system, loss of muscle strength can make it harder to regain balance if someone starts to fall. And within the three sensory systems, um, the different systems can become affected. So in the somatosensory system, there's information about the body's position and the motion um, related to the body's position. So there's information about joint position and there's also information about touch and vibration sensitivity here. In our visual system, there's information about the environment and our orientation to our environment. Within the vestibular system, there's information about our head position and also our spatial orientation. So deterioration in any one of these inputs can reduce the sensory redundancy available to the central nervous system to update the balance control system 
and may adversely affect balance and increase fall risk. So there's also different types of perturbations that can happen, like, so external factors um, that can affect um, someone's balance system. So the first one is a mechanical perturbation. So mechanical perturbation is when there's forces acting on the body, so due to body movement or interaction with an environment. So an example of this one would be, say, if you were walking in the mall, uh, pre-COVID, of course, um, and someone ran into you and um, you got bumped into. So that's your kind of, your musculoskeletal system is interrupted and that can lead to a fall. There's also something called um, information perturbation. So this is a transient change in the nature or orientation of information available. So an example of this would be our visual system. So walking in a dark room at night. So we have less information to send that reactive feedback. There's also um, somatosensory system can be affected. So walking on the beach, there's an uneven surface and that can cause less information or distorted information being sent to the somatosensory system, which distorts the feedback and perturbates the whole system. So there's increased risk of balance impairments or balance unsteadiness and a fall. The last one here is a physiological perturbation. So physiological perturbations affect the central nervous system itself. Um, so this can be a transient event, um, such as the neurological control, um, possibly postural hypotension or a stroke, something that happens within the brain or the spinal cord itself that can lead to a disruption of information. So overall, um, if we improve someone's balance, we can reduce someone's fall. So that's the key message here. And we know that uh, falls are a major concern in Canada and falls are the leading cause of injury among Canadians. And this is from the Public Health Agency of Canada and 20 to 30% of seniors experience one or more falls each year. So very prevalent. We also know that 85% of seniors injury related hospitalizations are related to falls and a staggering 95% of all hip fractures are related to a fall. And this is uh, costing our healthcare system over $2 billion. Uh, and some more statistics here, uh, over a third of seniors admitted to long-term care are hospitalized for a fall. And the average um, Canadian stays in hospital for 10 days longer for falls than any other cause. Uh, so falls are quite a concern for us. Um, and at an individual level, Falls can result in chronic pain, reduced mobility, loss of independence, and even death. And 50% of falls uh, happen within the home environment. So what can we do about falls and what are the evidence, what's the evidence showing us? So this is a fabulous article um, from last year in the New England Journal of Medicine on the prevention of falls in community dwelling older adults. It highlights many case studies and also clinical reasoning uh, behind these case studies about assessments and falls interventions. So I would encourage you um, to grab this article as a good read. Um, on the next few slides, I'll be providing a highlight, highlights from this article about risk factors for falls. So this was table one within the article and it outlines risk factors and underlying impairments related to falls. Uh, so we know that medication can cause falls um, due to sedation, confusion, orthostatic hypotension, ataxia, um, those concerns. We also know that the environment, um, so the interaction between functional limitations and hazards such as tripping hazards within our environment or low light uh, conditions can also lead to a fall. Uh, the literature shows us also that cognitive impairment, and particularly dementia, is related with increased fall risk. And this is related to changes within the central nervous system um, and also related to planning and executive functioning, reasoning. Um, depression has also been associated 
with falls. And this is because there's decreased um, mental processing psych or loss of confidence in order to um, participate in activities, which can lead to increased fall risk. So this chart continued here. Um, so balance impairments and gait impairments, which is the focus of this um, webinar here, uh, can also lead to falls. Um, visual impairments, uh, impairments in depth perception or sensitivity, uh, and also orthostatic hypotension have all been identified as fall risk, uh, increasing someone's fall risk. So this article um, goes on to outline the common domains of multifactorial factorial assessment and intervention. And I'm just focusing here on balance and gait problems. Um, so for balance and gait and strength, the assessment strategy includes having someone rise from a chair, walking and standing balance, and the in potential interventions include exercise, physical therapy, having an assistive device such as a cane or a walker. However, when I start to go through these, um, this article, my next question is how effective is exercise to reduce falls? So I dug a bit deeper into the literature and I found two fantastic reviews um, by Sherrington and colleagues. So Sherrington is a researcher clinician from Australia and she conducted an updated systematic review and meta-analysis and also an abridged Cochrane systematic review. So these are two key articles um, from last year that really uh, help us to understand how effective exercise is for falls. So the key points um, from these articles are that exercise reduces fall rates in community dwelling older adults by 23%. So that's <clears throat> great. And also um, exercise that challenges balance and is more than three hours per week is what's recommended. And the third recommendation was balance exercises plus functional exercises plus resistance exercises reduce falls by 34%. So we want to be looking at multifactorial exercise exercise interventions. Um, the article also suggested that Tai Chi may reduce falls by 19%. Um, however, there was low certainty evidence here. However, the authors also concluded that there's limited evidence of the effectiveness of dance beyond neurological conditions of Parkinson's disease and stroke. And my research, my postdoctoral research is looking at the effectiveness of dance in older adults without these type of conditions. So that leads me um, to emerging evidence uh, for falls prevention. So this is where my postdoctoral research fits in um, to understand if dance can help to reduce falls. So dance is embedded in our lives in one way or another, but dance is not only fun, it's a great way to keep your mind and your body healthy. So as a rehabilitation scientist, I study how the body and the mind work together to execute purposeful rhythmic movement to music. So dance makes you become in tune with your movements um, by, with added mental challenges. So you have to learn how to execute the dance steps and to move to the beat with that emotional expression. There's multiple mind-body systems involved at the same time. So it's multifactorial. Oops. It's multifactorial. And uh, dance is an exercise that can benefit your brain and overall health. And also um, is where you have emerging evidence about false prevention, which I'll show you. So this is, um, I am the sci scientific curriculum lead uh, for the Jarris Dance Program. And together we developed Jarris Dance with rehabilitation and geriatric medicine expertise. And we developed this program in collaboration with seniors and community stakeholders. So this is a research program that we've implemented um, across Southern Ontario. Uh, Jarris Dance is evidence-based and clinically proven. Uh, to improve seniors' mind-body health. So why is Jarris Dance different? 
So Jerris Dance is different than a regular dance program because it's designed with a lens of a rehabilitation and geriatric medicine expertise to make dance accessible for older adults and older adults without a specific diagnosis. So those experiencing early memory problems or mobility problems. The curriculum is progressive and evidence-based and it focuses on something called the ABCs of movement. So the ABCs of movement are agility, so how fast someone's moving, a balance, and also the coordination of the body. This program uh, adheres to the recommended exercise dose based on those two systematic reviews of 180 minutes per week. And it has instructor-led and home-based exercises. So this slide here, uh, so the true power of our program is in what our participants say. So our participants say that is affecting, uh, improving their mind, their body, and also their spirit. So I'm just gonna play a few short clips about um, what they are saying. So this is from the mind. So these, these were participants from our in-person classes prior to COVID. Okay, so we just have a little bit of problem with the... Okay, so I'm just gonna reshare my screen one second so we can get the audio shared. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm just going to close this, share audio sound. It's a fun time. We Did enjoy that work? getting together. It's, everybody here. That's working. Time. Great. Thanks, Patricia. Be like minded. <laughs> okay. And this clip here is about the body. I thought I'd be in a wheelchair for a month. But coming here, doing the exercising and the moving, I recovered faster. And this is about the new friendships in mind. And there's no sound. So he's talking about the connection between his mind and his body and learning new dance steps. So the Jerry's Dance Program has been extended uh, across Southern Ontario and in the YMCA locations. We have 28 instructors trained and also 430 older adults participating in the program. We've also currently uh, adapted the program to virtual delivery. And we have some opportunities if you'd like to extend this program uh, into your center. And I'll discuss those at the end of the presentation. So a part of developing this program and being a researcher, I received uh, funding uh, from the McMaster uh, Institute for Research on Aging. And this was for my postdoctoral work. And I wanted to explore if the Jarris Dance program can improve falls uh, risk in older adults. So I'm gonna show you uh, the, the results of our pilot study. So the background question was, can dance reduce fall risk? And how is this all related together? So dance is a rhythmic movement with, that requires precise body coordination to music. And gait is rhythmic movement that requires precise body coordination to propel the body forward. And we know from the research that older adults who are fallers walk with less rhythm and reduced body coordination. So we hypothesized that if we improve someone's dance skills, that will in turn improve their walking patterns and ultimately reduce their fall risk. So for this uh, pilot study, we explored the relationship between dance gait and fall risks in older adults with early memory or mobility problems. So our pilot study was a single arm pre-post design with a 12 week intervention phase. We use this mat here and this mat's called a protokinetics uh, Xeno mat. And it's an electronic mat that has pressure sensors within it. And as the participant walks along the mat, it sends information to a computer uh, which analyzes their gait patterns. And then we had the participants 
um, participate in in, cl in class, uh, Jairus dance classes. And this occurred over 12 weeks, twice weekly uh, for one hour. And this was at the YMCA. And as you can see here, the participants are doing seated dance. So this is an adapted ballroom dance. Um, there about 50% of the class is done within a seated uh, position. And then the same steps are repeated within standing positions. The overall curriculum uh, for Jairus Dance is progressive. So in the beginning classes, the uh, participants are learning those foundational movements about how to move their body forwards and backwards and side to side. And as they progress across um, through the 12 weeks, they start to combine different movement patterns, increasing the speed and rhythmicity of the movement. So after participating in the 12 weeks of the dance, um, we then brought the participants back to the research center and had them walk again on the, the gate map. So for the gate assessment, we assessed the gate in two experimental conditions. So first during normal walking and secondly during dual task walking. And our cognitive dual task here was zero subtraction by three. Uh, so we had participants walk along the mat and count backwards by three. Uh, so nine, six, three, zero. Um, and the gate outcomes that we looked at were walking speed. So how fast someone's going. We looked at the rhythmicity of the gate. Um, double support time, meaning the percentage of time when two feet were on the ground. Uh, we looked at step length time, so how fast each step was. And we looked at coordination, so how long the steps were, so step length, and the distance between um, the both feet, uh, so the step width. We analyzed this with separate two-way repeated measure ANOVAs, um, having two time points, so before dance and after dance, and all having those two different cognitive load um, conditions. So just normal walking and then having that zero subtraction by three. So this was our participant flow. So we had originally 30 participants recruited and screened uh, to participate in this study. And these were from uh, both clinical uh, referrals and also from our community partners um, from the YMCA and Alzheimer's Society. We, um, one person was not interested, three were busy, one had a conflict in time and two had transportation issues. So that left us with an N of 23 people. Uh, two people dropped out uh, before starting the intervention uh, due to a change in availability. And throughout, the 12 weeks, we had five um, individuals drop out of our program. Uh, one said that the class was too easy for them. Uh, three had family members that became ill and one we did not know. So our total um, in the study was 16 who did pre and post test assessments, which is adequately powered to assess gate, these specific gate measures. So the attendance of the program was 83%. Overall, so attending 20 out of, tw um, out of um, 20 out of 24 classes. And the average age was 72. Um, and the range of these participants was 64 to 83. So these are the results here. So this graph shows walking speed. Um, so walking speed before and after dance. So on the y-axis here, we have um, walking speed in meters per second. And on the x-axis, we have our experimental conditions. So this is the normal walking and the dual task walking. The gray bar is before dance and the blue bar is after dance. So what we can see is that there's similar results during the dual task and normal task um, normal walking, that um, the walking speed is increasing during both of these conditions. But one of our most interesting results is when we start to look at the threshold for safe community ambulation. So that threshold is at 0.8 meters per second. 
And that's the threshold where someone can independently walk um, across or safely walk across a crosswalk. So that's how fast you need to be walking. Um, so when we start to look at that threshold, um, we can see that the walking speed um, before dance, so when you're doing, when you don't have any ch cognitive challenge, is now the same as when you have that cognitive challenge. So not only are you walking faster with a cognitive challenge, you're walking just as well um, as without a challenge before. Um, so diving deeper into the analysis, uh, we found that dance um, also improves rhythmicity or timing of gait. Uh, so with this double support time, they're having less time with two feet on the ground. And we also found that there is less time uh, or delay between each consecutive step. So having a lower stride length time. And we found that the coordination as well improves um, with longer steps being taken, representing improved anterior posterior coordination and smaller stride width representing improved medial lateral stability and coordination. So bringing all these results together, this is a representative uh, profile from the Protokinetic Center Xeno walkway. And so this is what comes out uh, after walking on that mat. So this is from one of our participants. So this participant um, was quite hesitant um, to walk, uh, had a high level of fear of falling prior to the dance program. Um, however, had no uh, diagnoses um, going into this. And so I'm gonna show you her gait before dance. So as you're looking at this gait, you can see that she is walking very, uh, with very short steps and, and a, a slower gait. So it's taking her about 12 seconds to walk across this mat, uh, which is about three meters. So if we watch that again, so this is her left foot, right foot. So very slow steps, short, kind of um, a shuffling gait. So this now is the same participant um, walking after the Jairus Dance program. So when you start to look at this gait, you can see that she has longer steps. Uh, so this is the left foot, the right foot. So there's more distance between each step. She's also walking at a faster pace. Um, so it took her five seconds uh, to walk this when before it took her 12 seconds. So she's almost about 50% faster uh, when she's walking. And you can also see um, the distance so the step width, so the distance between the center of this foot and the center of this foot, so this distance here, she has a little bit of a wider um, base of support here too, um, versus this one is very shuffling. So I'll play those again. Uh, so the first walking before the dance, and again, walking after the dance. So we can see a dramatic improvement here. And this, although this is only one participant, uh, we, were, we saw these results across all of our participants and that Jair stance is leading to faster walking, better rhythm and better coordination in our pilot study. So in conclusion, uh, our results from my postdoctoral work was that Jair stance improves gait speed, rhythmicity and coordination. And we also had very high um, program satisfaction and adherence. So 100% um, of our participants who finished the program would recommend it to a friend or family member. And 90% of our participants rated the program as excellent. And one of the most interesting uh, parts of this program was that not only were friendships made within the program itself, they were also made to extend beyond. So 50% of the, the participants started a coffee, a coffee club um, at the YMCA and they were meeting after class to kind of to, to have a lunch and to chat um, together. 
And this not only extended during the 12 weeks, um, after when we followed up with the participants, the coffee club was still going on. So there's something very special that happens during a dance um, intervention. Uh, so our next steps, uh, so this the JARIS Dance Program of Research, um, we are conducting RCTs, we're looking at cognitive function, we're looking at frailty as well. And so this is, um, so we received additional funding uh, for the JARIS Dance Program of Research uh, from CABI for virtual implementation. So this involves live stream classes uh, on an iPad uh, twice weekly for one hour. And our program has been shortened for the live um, virtual implementation to six weeks. And we are looking for retirement homes or community centers to pilot test this program. So if you are interested, we are launching uh, next month um, with this and you can just send me a quick email and I can provide you with more information about this. So that concludes the formal part of my talk. So I'd like to thank everybody um, for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. I saw a few questions coming in on the Q&A um, and we can also add the email address um, into, the, into the chat there. Great, so before we do that, um, I just wanted to thank Patricia for this really wonderful presentation and for sharing obviously extensive knowledge of how dancing can indeed reduce fall risk. So thank you for that. As you mentioned, we did have a few participants submit um, their questions in the Q&A box, but also the chat box. So participants, I do encourage you, if you put them in the chat box, please put them in the Q&A box so we can kind of plow through um, the session. So um, again, also thank you participants for um, doing that. So let's go ahead and do that now. So Patricia, did you want to read some of the questions that you saw? Uh, yep. So just let me open the, the chat box. Yeah. And take your time. No worries. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So I see that we have um, a question here from Simon. Thank you very much for asking a question. Um, so the question is, is somatosensory also called proprioceptive? Um, so Proprioceptive is a part of the somatosensory information. So proprioceptive is linking to joint position. Um, and there's also within the somatosensory system cutaneous uh, information. So that is touch and vibration sensitivity. So both proprioceptive and cutaneous information link together to make the somatosensory system. Thank you. Um, so our next question here is from Deb, and it says, where can I become certified uh, as a Jarvis Dance instructor? Uh, so great question. Uh, we have a certification program. Uh, if you can send me an email, I can link you up with that. Currently, um, we have certified instructors within our um, program of research. Uh, so you can become an instructor within the research. Uh, is there any available, sorry, next question is from Dan. Uh, is there any available dance programs within Perth? Uh, so right now we do not have in-person um, classes within Perth due to restrictions for COVID. However, we do have the virtual implementation and we can share my uh, email if you are interested in becoming, uh, uh, interested in that. Okay, so I think once you click the questions, they're going away. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so any questions that you've answered already will go under the answer column. Um, oh, okay, fantastic, thank you. Yes. And just like the, the question is this <laughs> morning. Um, okay, so will this program be, so another question from an anonymous attendee, uh, will this program be offered across the country and will there be available training as an instructor? Uh, so yes, we're hoping to scale the program across the country uh, with the virtual implementation, for sure we can have that. So um, if you want to be a part of our CABI implementation, pl please email me. And um, should, would you be able to add my email to the chat box so people can have it there? Uh, 
I can just go oh, back on the slides actually. Yes, and, and also I'll include this information um, whenever I send out the webinar recording and um, slide back. Okay. Um, so there's another question from Nikita. Um, so thank you for the great presentation. Um, how were older adults involved in the dance program design? Uh, so we received funding for this from Mira, so McMa the Master Institute for Research on Aging. And we used a co-design process, uh, working with the older adults to pilot test the program. Uh, they were involved in helping us to pick the music um, that resonated with their cohort. Uh, so we found that music from the 50s and 60s uh, was most beneficial for this cohort and something that they really enjoyed. Um, the seniors were also involved in pilot testing the dance moves. Um, so some of the dance moves uh, we, from an evidence-based um, perspective and a motor control perspective, we thought that they would be great. But however, in actual implementation, the seniors didn't enjoy certain moves. So we modified them to make sure that they were accessible for all, all participants. Thank you for the question. Um, so there's another question from Anonymous and it said, will there be a recording? Yes, there'll be a recording and uh, that will be sent out. Um, so there's a question from Frankita. Um, so at our day program for persons with dementia, could one of our staff be trained to lead the program and implement the program? Uh, yes, so we can have that within our virtual implementation. Um, so if you're interested, um, please send me an email. Thank you. Um, so Jacqueline also is asking about the uh, virtual implementation. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to, with this CAVI funding, we're able to pilot test um, the program. So expand it to different areas. Uh, thank you so much for all the interest in, in the JARIS Dance program. Okay. Um, so there's a question here from Angelica. Uh, so thank you for the informative presentation. Have you identified any barriers to implementation such as hesitancy to participate due to fear? And if so, how have you navigated this? Um, so when recruiting um, participants, particularly from clinic, clinical settings, um, there has been some hesitancy to participate in dance. We do allow uh, within the in-person sessions for caregivers to attend the classes with the individual to help increase the level of comfort there. Okay, so there's lots of questions coming in here. Um, so a question from Dan, how long is a typical dance se session? Um, so our in-person sessions, actually both in-person and virtual sessions are one hour in duration. Um, but we do include time for socialization. So the movement component is about 40 minutes. Um, sorry. Okay, so Laura has asked a question here. Um, is the class completed in seating? sitting? Um, so we have both uh, seated and standing positions in, in Jarris Dance. Uh, all dance steps are first taught in a seated position and then uh, standing is completed after, um, just to increase that level of confidence of our participants. Okay, uh, Deb is asking here, is there a cost to participants? Um, so at this time, there is no cost for participants as this is funded research. Um, so in the spring, summer implementation, there'll be no cost as it's part of a research program. Um, okay, so, uh, so Teresa is asking a question here. Uh, we run a volunteer dance program at a long-term care facility would this program be available? So this program would be available for virtual implementation um, to take part in the research program. Yes. So if you can send me an email.
Um, so, Karine is asking a question, are there any biases in this research and the results can be influenced by something else? Um, so definitely uh, these are pilot studies that I presented today. Um, so there was no control group. Um, however, pilot studies are very important to have understand the feasibility of dance interventions and interventions in general. Um, biases might be just having being participating in exercises um, might have boosted mood in general. Um, however, our objective measures of gait by the gait mat um, are pretty robust. And so it should, we would expect the same results in a randomized control trial. Uh, Simon is asking, do you have any recordings of the class for us to see? Um, so you can visit the jariscenter.ca website and we have some previews of uh, preview videos as well. Um, so Marla is asking, now that you are virtual, um, how do you compensate for the social aspect? Um, so we have smaller groups uh, within our virtual implementation and we have time for socialization on a, a Zoom for healthcare platform. Um, so the socialization is facilitated um, by our trained instructors who are trained in Alzheimer's society communication techniques. Um, so Helen is asking if the virtual would be available in Vancouver. Yes, um, that can happen as well. So our virtual implementation in the study can happen anywhere across Canada. Okay, so another question here um, from Danielle. Uh, does each person have an individual assessment completed before they partake in the program? Um, so for our research study, yes, we do have individual assessments uh, taken before they partake, both within our virtual and our um, in-person sessions because we want to understand the effectiveness of the program. Um, anonymous question, do you have any First Nations communities participating in the program at this time? Uh, currently, we do not um, have any First Nation communities. However, this is something um, that we would be happy to facilitate. Um, so Maria Claude, um, thank you. Very interesting, innovative project. Is there a maximum number of participants per session? Um, so within our in-person sessions, the maximum capacity aligned with healthcare um, and safety regulations at the YMCA was 25 individuals. Um, our online sessions, we have about 15 people maximum. I think there's... Um, so any, did, is there any more chat in questions in the chat? So I was trying to keep up. There are a lot of questions that we had going. So I know there are a few. And, um, so I know there's a couple about email addresses. So I've already, I'm going to dismiss those. So we already shared that. Um, one individual had asked, and apologies if you answer this, but, um, there's, uh, are your facilitators trained from specific profession? Um, so yes, the Jarist Dance instructors are complete a certification course, which we have developed. Um, all of our instructors have a fitness background currently. And is the formation um, to become certified instructors going to be available also in French? Another individual has this. Um, we are working on that currently. Right now it's only available in English. Great. Um, so one individual asked, and I think you kind of touched on this, but I guess this is more in the realm of post-COVID. So are the um, the virtual sessions, will they be continuing post-COVID restrictions, whenever that may be? Um, that is the vision. I hope that the because um, the virtual sessions provide an additional opportunity for people to engage in exercise. So I think it's very important. Uh, we have to show that they're, they're effective. Um, so that's what the research is about. Great. And do you have any physiotherapists as part of the, the, the team? My apologies. 
Uh, yes, so physiotherapists were involved in the development of the program. Um, I'm an occupational therapist myself. We also had uh, geriatricians, uh, dance instructors, uh, fitness instructors, uh, older adults. So we had a variety of people involved. And so now this one is about the mat that you use. So what processes would be used if one does not have a prokinetics mat, but wants to do a before and after test? Um, and they also mentioned talk. Okay, um, sorry, where was that question? Oh, the tug, okay. Um, yeah, so if someone does not have a prokinetics mat, so a prokinetics mat is quite expensive and it's a research tool. Um, so if you would wanna do a pre and post, you can also use a stopwatch. Um, you can use the timed up and go like you suggested. Um, the timed up and go is a great evaluation tool um, to look at functional mobility. So standing up from the chair, walking, doing that turn. Um, so yeah, and has clinical cutoffs as well. So that's a great option if you do not have the technology. Great, so we do have a bit of time still. So I'm gonna continue, continue okay. going yeah. through these. Um, so thank you again, participants, for all these really great questions. If you have any, any additional ones, um, you can add them in. But if we can't get through all of them, um, Patricia has greatly uh, generously volunteered to um, kind of answer the remaining questions, and I'll be posting those on loop. So anyway, moving forward, um, has this been adapted to a more institutional environment, so hospital or long-term care homes? Uh, so currently, it hasn't. It's a community-based program. Um, so the audience is seniors who are dwelling in the community. Great. And is there a minimum group size? I feel like you might have touched on this, but it's, it's good repetition is key. Is there a minimum group size? Group size for, for the, I guess this was must have been when it was kind of in person. Um, was there a minimum in terms of the group size? Um, just for the feasibility, we only uh, 10 individuals was the minimum for our research study. Got it. And it, um, this individual writes, I find that there's significant difference transitioning from seated to standing. Do you slow the tempo for this? Do we slow the tempo? Yes, yeah, so um, seated to stand, yes, it's a functional movement that requires a lot of lower leg strength and also a lot of balance control. Um, so, when we don't, it, within the curriculum, we do not have any active time while they're dancing where they're transitioning. So we would have a seated component stop the music and then someone can get out of a chair at their own pace and then re we'd restart the music to start the standing component. Um, we don't want anyone to feel too rushed um, getting out of the chair and possibly falling. Right, that makes sense. Um, and then one individual writes, are you looking for groups in one location or will the sessions be available to people individually in their homes? Um, we're happy to explore both options. Uh, we, for this, this study, we are looking for group. We can do both. Uh, so if you can send me an email, we can uh, talk about what we could do. And as, as uh, I've already included um, Patricia's email in the chat box, so feel free to send over those emails. Um, another person wrote, do you have participants complete a waiver for physical activity and liability? Uh, yes, we, as part of the research protocol, we do have a waiver for that. Great. And I'm just kind of scroll through. <laughs> there are so many questions, but that's, that's thank, so thank great. Thank you everybody for your interest in the program. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, somebody writes, uh, do you provide music for the classes to the instructors? Uh, yes, yeah, so everything uh, for the Jarvis Dance program is bundled, um, so we do provide music. Awesome. And uh, do you have any demo practice in seating and standing position? Uh, demo. We do have demo um, videos on our on the Jarvis Dance page on the website, the JarvisCenter.ca. Great. And just somebody wants you to repeat how, um, and I guess this is good for everyone, how often and how long each class is per week. Okay, yeah. Um, so for our in-person sessions, um, hopefully we'll be going back to those soon. Uh, so it is twice a week and it is one hour 
for each class. There's also a homework component where we send uh, homework sheets home to have people learn about uh, and practice different dance steps. And it's for 12 weeks in duration. So that's our in-person. And for our um, virtual sessions, they're also one hour in length twice a week, but it's a six week um, duration. Great, I hope that um, helps to fill in some gaps there. And so one individual rides, do participants fill out uh, the park use? Uh, park U form, uh, yes. liability. Uh, yes, we do have participants fill out a park U. And if there's any concerns, um, also have a waiver from their doctor for clearance for exercise. Got it. And how long does certification take? Is there um, a recertification interval? Um, yeah, so the certification has been embedded within our program of research. Uh, certification courses are that we developed are 15 hours in length. Great. And uh, so we are hitting the 56 mark. So we just have a few minutes and I will like to wrap up. So I'm going to maybe just take two more questions. So um, one individual writes, uh, da -da -da. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the beach, could a person improve their balance in this regard by walking more on the sand? Yeah, so practicing walking on different environments would definitely help um, to train um, how to compensate for differences, perturbation, uh, differences in this mass sensor information. Great. And the final question that I can get through today is, what is the reason for the 12 week in person to the six week virtual? Um, that's feedback from our participants, um, because that's, yeah, it's feedback from our participants that they wanted a shorter duration when they were trying something virtual. Awesome. awesome. Great. So we, we do have just a few questions remaining that I'll, I'll send over to you, Patricia M. And we'll, we'll try to get those answered and shared back to participants. So do check back on loop for some of those outstanding questions. But okay. um, in, in the interim, thank you all to our participants today for really joining and engaging in, in this really a great discussions. And thank you again, um, Patricia, for uh, you know, doing this great uh, loop webinar. So for more information about the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, please visit loop at fallsloop.com. And when the webinar has ended, you'll be redirected to Zoom and invited to participate in just a very short evaluation survey. All you got to do is click the blue continue button on your browser and you'll be redirected to the survey. And as always, we'd appreciate if you could provide feedback um, about the webinar you just experienced. So that brings us to an end. Thank you again, everyone, and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.